Thank you. Good evening. It's an honor and a great pleasure to be with you here at St. George's to celebrate the life and work of Harry T. Burley. 93 years ago, on March 30, 1924, the first Vesper service of Negro spirituals was held here at St. George's. This special Vesper service celebrated the 30th anniversary of Burley's hiring as baritone soloist. He was a 27-year-old student at the National Conservatory of Music, just two blocks and around the corner from St. George's. The excitement surrounding Burley's 30th anniversary would have startled the 1894 congregation, many of whom greeted the appearance of the handsome young black man in the choir with dismay, to say the least. Some report that seeing the new baritone soloist, and I quote, so scandalized the congregation that it rose in a body and left, end of quote. In the confusion and protest that followed, Burley was prepared to withdraw quietly. But William Chester, the choir master, had worked hard to make the choir a circle of friendship. And he assured Burley, you are now a member of this group. Your place is here with us. So Burley found his place in the St. George's Choir Loft, a position that provided a secure career foundation and a spiritual home nearly to the end of his long life. But the benefit flowed in both directions. It must also be said that Burley's fame as, bar as its baritone soloist conferred greater credibility on St. George's Church for its social activism. Led by a succession of distinguished rectors who were convinced that social reform lay at the heart of the Christian gospel, St. George's evolved into a much more diverse and open congregation than has often been understood. The Reverend Dr. William S. Rainsford was the rector who helped to bring St. George's to vigorous new life in the decade before Burley was hired. Music was central to Reverend Rainsford's, Rainsford's vision of the great city church. And I'm quoting, what we want to have is the most beautiful churches in the crowded districts and the best music. Where life is sordid, you want beauty. Where life is crowded, you want the big church. Where there is discord, you want the most beautiful music. To the professional solo quartet, he added a robed volunteer choir brought to the front of the church. Their robes gave singers with diverse financial resources a uniformly, uniformly dignified appearance. And from their position at the front of the sanctuary, the choir could lead the congregation in singing the hymns and liturgical responses. Burley's presence drew many African Americans to St. George's, a welcoming church for them to attend in the long years before segregation ended. They came to hear him sing frequently and in large numbers. One of Mary Cardwell Dawson's um, National Negro Opera Company told me that that's what you did when you came to New York. You, can, you went to St. George's to hear Burley sing. And what has been known as J.P. Morgan's church came to be known to taxi drivers and others as Mr. Burley's church. By 1924, Burley had become a nationally known baritone and internationally regarded composer of art songs. And by art songs, I mean secular songs, often love songs written for a trained singer, usually accompanied by piano, as we're hearing this evening. Unfortunately, Burley's art songs are not so well known today as his art song arrangements of spirituals, but that's changing. But the success of Burley's art songs prepared for the immediate reception of his spiritual arrangements. Exactly 100 years ago, in the 1916-1917 concert season, Burley's first published solo arrangements of spirituals burst on the concert-going public. His arrangement of Deep River was premiered in late 1916 by Mary Jordan, the contralto soloist of the wealthy Temple Emmanuel, where Burley sang from 1900 to 1925. Deep River literally hit the charts that season. Critics in New York and Boston reported that Deep River appeared more often in recitals that season than any other song. Burley's publisher issued a sheet music version that listed 21 famous singers who performed Deep River that season. President Woodrow Wilson's daughter Margaret sang it. 
Afri uh, Dudley Bucks, composer Dudley Bucks, voice student, sang it. African American tenors Roland Hayes and Sidney Woodward sang it. Burley's choral arrangement of Deep River had been premiered several years earlier in 1913 by Kurt Schindler's Schola Cantorum. The choral arrangement uh, of Deep River was a staple of the annual Vesper services of Negro spirituals. The 1924 Vesper service drew crowds that filled all seats and standing room a half hour before the service began. Police assistance was needed to keep the streets open for traffic. City newspapers reported that many who were turned away stayed hoping to greet Burley after the service. One newspaper reported that, and I quote, people well known in exclusive social and business circles sat in the same pew or stood side by side with people of Burley's race, end of quote. This was newsworthy in 1924. For the hundreds who could not be admitted to this church, the service was repeated several weeks later. Six years, uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> The music performed on that first service of Negro Spirituals um, was, were co co solo and choral arrangements of spirituals, all of them by Burley. Two new songs Burley wrote for the occasion, the, Rev the Ryland uh, Amen, written in honor of Reverend Carl Ryland, the rector at St. George's in 1924, and two movements from Burley's 1916 suite of violin piano pieces, Southland Sketches. I might mention that in later years, uh, arrangements by other composers were featured, uh, Hall Johnson, Undine Smith-Moore, Eva Jesse, Florence Price, uh, George Kemmer, and um, Natalie Curtis Berlin, and Burley's son, Alston Burley. George Kemmer was hired as St. George's choir master and organist in 1923. Kemmer remembered Burley from his days as a boy chorister and honored him as an arranger of spirituals. The choir of 80 voices sometimes sang spirituals in the Sunday morning services, but more often, spirituals were part of the afternoon Vesper services held weekly from November to May. The special 1924 Vesper service of Negro spirituals began an annual tradition that drew large audiences to the church and increasing public recognition to Burley and to St. George's for its liberal and inclusive role in New York City's church and music community. Now, in addition to the yearly press notices of his Palm Sunday rendition of Jean-Baptiste Faure's The Palms and frequent mention of his solos, New York City papers carried feature articles announcing the annual Vesper service of Negro spirituals and often a review following the service. St. George's pride in Burley's work was more than matched by its significance to African Americans in New York City and far beyond. We can see this in reports of another service of spirituals by the St. George's choir this time in Harlem, a month after that first Vesper service of Negro spirituals. The Mother AME Zion congregation had recently moved into their, their new building on West 137th Street, and the people of Harlem paid tribute to, quote, Dr. Harry T. Burley, the race's most distinguished musician, end of quote. They packed the spacious auditorium to welcome Burley and his faith, fellow members of the choir of aristocratic St. George's Protestant Episcopal Church with their rector, Dr. Carl Ryland, and the organist choir master, George W. Kemmer. And I quote, this was the first time a choir from one of the large, wealthy, and prominent white churches in New York City had paid a visit to a Harlem colored church, and the tremendous audience which assembled seemed to sense the fact that they were taking part in a history-making event. End of quote. This was only one of a number of times when Burley brought the St. George's congregation together with his African-American community. On that fateful Sunday afternoon in 1924, Harry T. Burley's voice was heard far beyond this sanctuary. That Sunday, two services at St. George's were broadcast over the radio. The Ukrainian National Chorus performed in the early afternoon and both this and the four o'clock Vesper service were broadcast. 
Radio broadcasting was in its infancy. The first radio station, KDKA in Pittsburgh, broadcast its first programs only four years earlier, in 1920. From 1924 into the early 1930s, Burley's voice was heard across the nation by, stu by radio, singing and sometimes commenting on the spirituals he had done so much to preserve and make known. In 1925, the St. George's Vesper services began to be broadcast weekly on a major radio network. In the following years, these broadcasts, often featuring solos by Burley, became an effective outreach of the congregation, drawing many new parishioners to the church. It is impossible to overestimate the importance of the emergence of Burley's art song spiritual arrangements 100 years ago. Other composers, black and white, immediately followed with their own arrangements, and by 1925, James Weldon Johnson commented that the spirituals had a vogue. Most of Burley's art songs did not proclaim his identity as an African American, though some were settings of verse by other African Americans. They were about love, beauty, nature, themes that have occupied poets and composers for centuries. But as we have heard, his 1935 setting of the Langston Hughes poem, Lovely, Dark, and Lonely One, is clearly a black pride song. This song is in many ways a culmination of Burley's art song catalog, and it stands alongside his 1940 setting of the John Oxenham hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West, which he based on the spiritual, The Angels Changed My Name. Burley named the hymn McKee, in honor of Reverend Elmore M. McKee, the rector of St. George's in Burley's last 10 years as baritone soloist. These two songs reflect Burley's lifelong hope that through their art, African Americans could help to heal America's deepest wounds. This was Burley's hope for his music. We need this healing now more than ever. At the end of his life, Burley expressed regret that his many art songs had fallen out of use, but he took satisfaction in the continuing popularity of his spiritual arrangements. He had helped to ensure that this great free fountain of pure melody, as he called it, would continue to flow, that the spirituals, with their message of hope for freedom and human familyhood, would continue to be sung. In the image he often used, his work had helped to unlock the musical treasure of the spiritual. He had helped to coin that treasure in universal currency. As Antonin Dvorak had urged, Burley had helped to give those melodies to the world. Thank you. <laughs> 